Joe Duke Majan at the Duke Spine Institute here in Florida. We're getting ready to perform our third laser endoscopic surgery, laser spine surgery for the day. This patient is another two level L45, L5S1 for herniated discs. And I just saw the last patient off. She went home with her husband. She's doing great. The pain that she had before surgery is gone. Unfortunately, I couldn't do a, a stream for you because she's her leaving is at the same time we're doing this next surgery. So um, we're not able to do both at the same time. Despite what many of you think, we are a small operation. Our entire facility is 20,000 square feet. So we're not a big hospital with hundreds of thousands of square feet and lots of staff. We kind of do everything ourselves with 60 employees. Hey, let go, let go. Um, anyway, she's gone. Her back pain that she had before surgery is gone completely. She's very happy. Our next patient travels to us. Where are you from, sir? Maryland, Colorado. sorry, Colorado. Our patient is from Colorado. And he, you flew in here to have your back fixed, right? All right. So he's got two herniated discs, L45, L5S1. And he has something called a pseudo disc, which is a fake disc at S1 and S2. So I need to know that because I use x-ray to guide to myself to the to the discs that need to be fixed and we got to know about the fake disc because that's going to be seen on the x-ray usually. Okie dokie, let's get started. You're going to feel my hand on your back. That's just my hand, okay? And I'm mashing around, feeling for things. Now I'm going to give you some numbing medicine. You're going to feel a little stick and burn. Don't be alarmed, Don't. that's normal, okay? Don't try to move off the table. You got it? All right, so I'm gonna start the numbing process now. Sorry about that. I know it's uncomfortable. Now, during the surgery, I'll be talking to my team, okay? And I'll be talking to you as well. Sometimes I'll be talking to our audience. So just be patient. And if you're having any pain, just say, ouch, and I will take care of it for you, okay? Right now, I'm just giving you some numbing medicine under your skin. Four cc's. All right, are you comfortable where you are? He's uncomfortable? What's wrong? How can we make you more comfortable? Huh? Something under your ankle? Oh, you feel something squeezing your leg? That's a leg squeezer. That's to keep the blood circulating up your leg. So not much I can do about that. We'll try to get you get this done and get you asleep as soon as possible, okay? All right, so just bear with me. Remember, if you feel a lot of discomfort, you just say, ouch. And I'm going to do my best to give you some more numbing medicine and make it better, okay? Shot. I think I'm a little too low. Just try to relax. If you feel pain, just say ouch and we'll do something about it. I've been giving you more numbing medicine to try to make it more comfortable for you. You feel anything there? How's our blood pressure? Okay, listen. I need you to pull them down. Tw 20 points. Okay, 20 points. I always have to have one of these here, so you need to put one back here, okay? Always. Throughout the surgery. That's just me palpating around, okay? Should 
shot. Lateral. Let me know when you're good. Yeah. I think it's more than that, to be honest with you. I think you need to give him something to relax a little bit. I would talk to Dr. Santiago and ask him. All right, we need to, yeah, drop the table, please. Let's see where we are. All right, good. So I'm heading right for the L5S1. I think that's the pseudo disc down below that we're seeing on the MRI. So I'm happy with this trajectory so far. Shot. All right. Well, let's see what we can do here. It's not bad. Um, it's really not that bad. I wonder if we could try wagging just a little bit and then this, this type of thing. Okay, you see the facets are not lined up properly. Shot. All right, now let's see, is that better? I think it's better. I think it's better, but it's still rotated. Uh, let's go a little bit more and see what happens. Shot. I want to kind of look down the foramen. Let's go the other way. Go the other way. Stop. Shot. That's, I think that's better. Yeah, that looks better to me. That looks, looks better. Mm. You okay? What's wrong? Oh, you're talking about that leg squeezer? I wonder if we can get the S1 end plate lined up a little better. Let's try some wag. Oh, this, you're talking about this here? That's my hand right here. You feel that? Lower. The squeezer on your calf? On the foot. What, somebody want to check his, his left foot? Just look underneath there. See if you can find what's bothering him. Jordan, that's close. Let's try a little more wag. Are they in, this, in the area that's bothering you? I think that's worse. That's better. That's better. I can see down the disc now. All right. Well. Shot. That's got to be the facade, which it is. Sean, give me an AP. I just don't like that lateral view still. I don't know why. All right, so we're going to be doing two disc repairs here. L45, L5S1. All right. So let me see the lateral view is there. The AP view is there. We could be more medial. I'm going to try to get a little bit more medial. Shot. Lateral. Let's give me a lateral again. Did we get that foot issue fixed for you? Yeah. All right, good. Still some pressure? All right. I need you to do something up down here till you get those facets l lined up. Do you see them? Right where the tip of the needle is? Go up, take a shot, then go down, take a shot. That's worse. The other way. More, more down. Shot. That's better. Uh, 
I think we overshot it there. That may be as good as we're going to get it right there. So just leave it there. Shot. Where do you feel that? Shot. 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 Are you comfortable or are you uncomfortable? Shot. It's interesting. We're right there, but we're low, which is kind of where we want to be. Okay, shot. 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 You okay? Hmm? That's the disc. That was a tough one. But we got her done. All right, now let's focus on four five. So for those of you who are wondering, is this percutaneous surgery? The answer is no. Percutaneous surgery is done with a needle. There's a lot of misunderstanding about what percutaneous means. I mean, st strictly percutaneous means through the skin, but percutaneous procedures are needle-based procedures. They're just done with the needle only, nothing else. So this is an actual surgery. We're using a knife, we're making an incision shot. We're using uh, surgical tools. You can't use surgical tools through a needle. It doesn't work, shot. You actually have to do surgery, which is why it's a surgeon doing the surgery, not a pain management doctor, shot. Pain management doctors generally do needle procedures. Feel anything there? Huh? Now, how much of your symptoms are back pain? Huh? All right. So you do get bad back pain from time to time? Your main problem is your leg, though, right? Your left leg? Yeah. How bad is that on a scale of one to 10? Give me a number. How high? 10. 10 out of 10 at L45. All right, we found one of your bad discs, okay? We're gonna get that fixed. I'm gonna put you to sleep in just a minute now. I need your help just for another minute. So I didn't tell the patient I was injecting anything in their disc and you all saw how he reacted, I hope. He, he really felt a lot of discomfort. 
because I tested the L45 disk. L5S1, it just comes right out. Okay, <coughs> you can go to sleep now. When you wake up, we'll be done. Let's move the fluoro south one inch, just one inch, barely, just barely. I want to be able to see that 5.1 disc better. All right, that's good, right there. I can see the pseudo disc, the fake disc. It's the next one down. So I know I'm in the right place. I can see the herniation. This is what you call a grade five tear. It's the worst tear you can get. And it's got a big herniation associated with it, extrusion. And that's what he's got. Let me know when he's asleep. Huh? All right. We're going to get started. Can you count out loud for me? All right. So I've got the guide wire in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring the needle out. Okay. And we're going to use this guide wire to guide our instruments to do the surgery. Specifically, the guide wire will guide this guy first. This is called the dilator. That's my shot right there. And you can see the guide wire on the x-ray is skinnier. It's a lot skinnier than the needle because it goes down the middle of the needle. And you can see the guide wire at the bottom disc. Now this patient also has short pedicles. He was born with congenital short pedicles, which are n makes the spine narrower, causes spinal stenosis that you're kind of born with. It doesn't cause problems when you're young. It only causes problems as you get older. You get herniations, and those herniations make the stenosis worse. Shot? So I'm in I couldn't hear you. Yeah, yeah. So I'm right at the facets now, passing them. I'm in the foramen, and I'm at the disc herniation. I can feel it right there. He's not happy about that. He's feeling it. Sean, don't hold down on the button. It's a quick press. All right. I need to, you ready? I need to advance this dilator into the L5S1 disc space. Shot. And that's what we're doing right now. Once I get it started, I can take the guide wire out because now the tip of it is where I want it. Come on, Jordan. I'm not gonna send you a written invitation. Patient's asleep. The anesthesiologist has him sleeping while we do this. So there's minimal bleeding with the procedure, but there's not zero bleeding. Anytime you're cutting a human being, there's always going to be some, some blood. Shot. Once again, I don't want to advance the um, dilator shot. I want to advance the, the tube over the, over the dilator. So we just need to be real careful. Shot. Almost there. Shot. Very good. We're making some progress. Again, I'm advancing this this tube that I'm going to do all my work through. Um, over the dilator. Shot. Jordan. Shot. You have to frequently go back and check. You want to make sure you don't advance the dilator past the front of the disc into the pelvis. Shot. All right, getting there. Let me have the tool. Okay. 
no, I'm not done. I want this stuff back. Okay, just have it ready. Shot. Almost there. Shot. That looks pretty good. Take it. Shot. That's perfect. All right. So our patient has a large herniation here and I need to get pretty medial to get it. So I have to start a little more lateral, but you never want to go too far lateral, get end up creating problems. And we're not going to talk about those problems because I don't want to, I'm not superstitious, but I know other people are. Okay, we've got our fluid adapter on. We have our tube in. We have a pathway or a portal for me to do the surgery on the disc. Now we're gonna pass down that pathway or portal with the scope. And we're gonna take a look at what's going on inside that disc. I already know what's going on based on the MRI. We're gonna go in there and do our best to fix it. I have a question. Yes. One of the viewers says, when Dr. Duke injected the dyed L5-S1, he said it went right in. Does that indicate that the disc at this level did not contain the dye and has substantial fissures? Yes, it, indi it indicated there were huge fissures and that the dye just leaked out, basically. So it, it did still contain some of it, but a lot of it just leaked out through the tears, the fissures. And so um, I didn't get to to really pressurize the disc at all to elicit a painful response because everything just leaked out. All right. These are all fragments of herniation I'm, I'm teasing out. I'm going to have to do some teasing on this one because the herniated fragments that I'm most interested in are really m towards the middle. And I'm going to have to work my way over there to get them out. There's a lot of pieces of disc herniation. Okay. Let's get started with the laser. So good observation, yes, indeed. The large tears will leak the dye out very quickly. You won't get much pressurization. You may not get, uh, you may not be able to elicit a, a response. Luis, you got to move your face. He's got to let go of that wire so I can move it. He's holding it to holding me up. Here's a fragment right here. Luis, help me here. A little secret with the technique, the more medial the herniation is, the more lateral you need to start with your entry on the patient. That's a, something that Dr. Anthony Young taught me. A lot of people don't know that, that do endoscopic surgery. Dr. Young and I remain friends and his son, Chris, is also a surgeon, spine surgeon. Come on, Luis, teach him the right way to do this, please. It's a pinch and pull, not a, it's not a Greco-Roman wrestling match. Take. Um, there's the tear, by the way, that caused the herniation. 
So I'm going to go in there and clean it up. This patient's had back surgery before. I don't think I mentioned that. He had a microdiscectomy done uh, by another doctor um, somewhere up in Colorado. And the microdiscectomy was done for the same problem, this herniated disc. So it didn't work. And you see all this white stuff in here? This is all from an epidural he must have had. That's particulate matter. A lot of doctors use cheap medication like Depomedrol. And um, isn't that right, Luis? Yeah. Patel doesn't use Depomedrol for epidurals, does he? Yes, sir. Does he? No, 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 no. Because it has that particulate matter in it. It's like a impurity. But the reason they use it is because it's cheap. Not us. We don't use it because it, it's not supposed to be used in the spine like that because it has that impurity and the impurity causes scarring you can see it but um, other doctors don't necessarily know that it causes scarring that's the little white stuff it looks like snow um, or they don't care because it's cheaper. Mm, doesn't work as well as the good stuff. I don't really do epidurals because I'm not a pain management doctor. I do surgery. Dr. Patel does the epidurals in our practice. And he won't use the Depomedrol. This is all scar tissue right here. This is from the chronic inflammation from the annular tear and herniation. This is what a herniated disc does over time. It gets all scarred in. This will be our last laser surgery for the day. Uh, we've done three now. The first two patients have already gone home. Both of them very happy with no pain. And this patient hopefully will be successful. I don't know yet. I have to say his herniations are the worst out of all of them. He has more extrusion than really a disc bulge. His there's a piece of herniation right there, standby laser. It's not coming with the laser, so I'm gonna try to grab it. You can see that it's really a, a team effort between the laser and the pituitary to, to try to get everything. It's not one or the other, it's both. It doesn't wanna come, it's stuck down. So I'm going to take it out a little bit of time. Quick wipe. Unfortunately, herniated discs, truthfully, they don't come out usually in one piece. You got to grab them multiple times and try to get them out. Take. Okay, you got to take it off my bit. No. You trying to take my fingers off? I think. Sam here is training. He's doing a good job. He's learning very quickly. And Sam, where are you from? Egypt. Where in Egypt are you from, Sam? Alexandria. And what is Alexandria known for? Uh, tourism. tourism. My God, don't say tourism. Shame on you. <laughs> what is Alexandria historically known as? 
education, yep. right? Knowledge. There's a giant library there. Yep. How many thousands of years old is the library? 10,000 years old. And who, who's responsible for that library? Who created it? Huh? Greek, I guess. Was it the Greeks? Yeah. Was it Alexander the Great? I think Alexander the Great was from Macedonia, right? Yeah. So Sam is from Alexandria. He studied medicine there and came to the United States with his family and he now works here at Duke Spine. But I told, what did I tell you when I first interviewed you? I told you a bit of my, he my family history. My father is from Alexandria, Egypt. He's no longer with us. He passed away many years ago. But he was a, a doctor as well from Egypt, came to the United States from Alexandria, the same city that Sam is from. So a lot of people don't realize it, but I'm African American. I just have lighter skin. All right, so we're making some progress, but you can see there's a, a big wad of herniation right there. What you're seeing on the right, the pinkish surface is the end plate of S1. And I need to focus my attention on the herniation because we're starting to get closer and closer to like removing the base of it a little bit at a time. And I got to free it up from the scar tissue. This is the scar tissue. And then what I'm trying to do is break it up little bit at a time. As a matter of fact, I'd like for it all to come out at one time. Can I get a chair? All right, so it's not that I want to take it out a little bit at a time. I want to take it all out in one shot, but it won't let me do that. You don't think these herniations come out easy, do you? They don't. Once in a while, we'll get a herniation that comes out easy. Do we have the Grabzilla today, by the way? Yeah, the stool is perfect. Hmm? Yeah. How's our irrigation? Good? Uh. Any questions from our audience there, Sean? None other so far. I'm sorry? There are none other questions so far. All right. So for those of you wondering, why does somebody need surgery like this? Anybody that has back pain lasting more than two months, anybody that has leg symptoms of radiculopathy or sciatica or even neurogenic claudication, where they're having aching, cramping in their feet or calves or thighs with walking and standing, anybody with numbness in their feet that's due to a pinched nerve in their back, all of these people benefit, would benefit from this surgery. That, this is a surgery to fix those problems, okay? Are there other surgeries that could work too? Yes. One of those surgeries would be a fusion if it's done properly. You need a decompression and fusion, not just a fusion. We do those at Duke Spine Institute as well. 
So there's only a few surgeries that actually work to cure back pain. Basically two. Two surgeries that will cure back pain. You're watching one of them. The other one is a, a special kind of fusion that we do at Duke Spine Institute. Could this patient have had the other surgery with a fusion? Yes, but he didn't want to. He, didn't, he wanted to try to fix this problem without doing open surgery, without doing a fusion. I felt that we had a good chance of getting these herniations fixed with a laser endoscopically, and that's why we decided to go this route. Ultimately, I don't tell patients what surgery to have done. They choose. I give them the pros and cons of each way, and they decide what they want for them. Everybody's situation's a little bit different. All right. We're making our way out further and further, and you're going to see there's some fat from the epidural space right there that we got to deal with. So the herniation that I'm at interested in getting rid of is right at the roof, right at the 12 o'clock position of what you're seeing. All right, I'm going to need the grabber. Standby laser. Do we have the Grabzilla? Yeah. I'm going to need it at some point. We're at the base of the herniation here. Let's see the laser. Oh, somebody's getting some good sleep. And it's not me. Huh? Not us. the Grabzilla. Look at all that scar tissue there. Massive. Tell me when you're ready. Standby laser. Standby scope. So Grabzilla is just a pituitary that I can control the tip of it. Anything? a nice chunk. I don't want to put chunks back. The key is to shove in a piece of the towel and then pull the whole thing out nice and easy. You understand? You understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? take. Let's take a look at what we've done. Now, I didn't design these instruments. I didn't name them either. They were all created by a team in Germany. And the company that made this stuff is a team is a company called Wolf. W-O-L-F. 
And they're all FDA approved, of course, instruments and equipment. But Wolf is known for producing really high quality uh, endoscopic equipment. And that's who I've used over the years. Uh, there have been other companies. They wanted my business. But they've never really shown me anything that makes me want to change what I'm doing. And no, none of their doctors have the results I have. Not even close. Much worse. So why would I change what I do just yet unless I see better? That's how I am. I, I don't change unless I see something much better. All right. So we're going to need to come back a little more and again use the laser to free things up. Get that suction off, please. I don't want the suction. Where is that coming from? Oh, okay. I was going to say, I don't see it there at the bag. Or I don't see it at the the um, adapter. All right. I apologize for the poor visibility, folks. That's just a little bit of bleeding. Very minimal amount. As a matter of fact, it would be akin to you clipping your nail with a nail clipper and having a small amount of blood on the end of your finger. It's just that we're using a magnified view to see it all. That's why you're seeing, seeing it the way it is. All right, let's use our, our Grabzilla. Stand by. Scope off. Doctor, you doing all right? No. Let's see. Uh, take that. Do not lose that. Let's get the scope back on and in. Watch this. So that's where the herniation is, up there. We're at the base of it, trying to grab it out. Take, laser. Sam, let me have control of the wire. So we're basically nibbling away at the herniation, at the base of the herniation. 
or imagine an, an iceberg sticking up out of the water. We're nibbling away at the base of the iceberg to get it to come back down into the water and stop sticking up so much. That's basically what we're doing. Unfortunately, the end plates are bleeding just a little bit. I'm not concerned about the blood loss. It's too minimal. It's too minuscule really to worry about, but it just, it does affect the visibility. And I actually feel comfortable with the anatomy at this point, but it makes it harder for you all to see what it is that I'm doing. How's he doing? Well, this is the hardest one for sure. Yeah, they're both they're both big, but this is as a matter of fact, you know, we got a new MRI yesterday and it showed that the one above this that we're gonna do next has actually gotten a lot bigger. So this poor man has been suffering. And I'm hoping this is going to work for him. If this doesn't work, his next step is a fusion. I think it's going to work though. I've never had this procedure not work. So. a question. Yeah. One of the viewers is wondering, Dr. Duke, do you see many older patients with really good conditioned spines? So do I see many older patients with really good conditioned spines? The answer is no, because people that come see me generally have a problem with their spine. So if they have a really good conditioned spine, they wouldn't, they really don't come see me. So the truth is, is I see people who are suffering badly. They have a lot of pain. But um, I guess if somebody were to ask me, is it possible to have a good spine when you're older? The answer is yes. Yes, yes it is. As long as you don't injure your spine, you protect it, you take care of it. Stand by laser. You, you can preserve your spine and keep it from any injury, you know? But I'll be honest with you, I truly believe there's a big um, genetic component to spine problems. And what I mean by that is, I believe that there are a lot of people that have, um, let me have Grabzilla. There's a lot of people that have, um, back problems that um, in my opinion are related to a kind of a genetic component for lack of a better word. In other words, they, they've got genes that just predispose them to having issues, okay? That was decent. Not much there. Oh, that's nice. That was a good one. Oh, yeah. Take that. Let's go take a look. So what kind of things did, can people have genetically that would make them have problems? Well, 
Remember, the disc is really made up of elastin and collagen and those kinds of things, connective tissue. So people with a connective tissue disorder, right? Maybe not quite having Marfan syndrome or Ehlers-Danlos, which are connective tissue disorders that are genetic. Maybe they don't have it that bad, but they've got enough problem with their connective tissue that the discs just fail miserably during life. They get tears and inflammation and pain in those tears, right? I personally think that's why there's so many people that have back pain and neck issues with their discs. I think they have a genetic predisposition. I think it's coded for in their DNA. Because there's lots of people with disc injuries that heal them. So if I were to take a um, hundred people off the street right now that are over the age of 40, hundred people over the age of 40 off the street and I get MRIs on all of them, on their spines, 100% of them will have a herniated disc, 100%. Let me have a grabber. But only 5% of them will have pain from the herniated disc. And why is that? Why is that? That's because disc herniations are common. Symptoms from the herniated disc are uncommon. Let's have the Grabzilla. For those of you wondering why we call it the Grabzilla and whether or not there's any relationship to, yes, our favorite monster of all times, Godzilla, the answer is yes, there is a relationship. The Grabzilla is big and beefy. It's designed for one purpose, to do exactly what I'm doing right now, to go in and try to take the herniation out. And it's got a beautiful mouth to do it. It has a, a nice mouth that is pretty good at grabbing things, like herniated discs, like that piece right there has a beautiful piece. Nice chunk right there. We just got a big chunk out. Let's see if we can do another one. You don't need the Grabzilla for every case. You only need it for the worst cases, the most difficult cases, like this one, where the herniation is just really posterior and medial. Beautiful. We're almost done. Almost done. Feel pretty good about that. So, because of our trajectory where we are right here, we're able to get more of the herniation out than a standard paramedian approach, which is a microdiscectomy because of our angle of attack coming more lateral. You can see the epidural veins. Luis, I need help getting this to the 12 o'clock. Just about done here at L5S1. Let's see what we got. I'm having trouble rolling it again.
Grab her. Any questions from our audience? No, no, there's currently. All right. Well, we are just about done with this disc. And we have, uh, there's a piece of herniation right there. Just came out. Let's see if I can grab it. It's misbehaving. Come on out. You can wipe. Nice. There's another piece right there. Pretty good size herniation right there. Look at that guy. Let's show the audience. Can you see this? That's a big one. Uh, we need me. light on. Look at Luis's hand. Move it here. Put your hand here. You all see that big piece that came out? That's a piece yes. of herniation. Okay. So. Look at this beautiful surgery. No bone removed, no laminectomy, no foramenotomy. I mean, no weakening his spine any more than the other surgeons have already weakened it with their other surgeries that he's had. It's just so elegant, such an elegant procedure. Laser, I can get a little bit more of that. And this is taking longer than normal. Why? Because this patient's had very scarred in disc herniation, number one. Number two, it's very big. This is a lot bigger than the ones we did earlier today. Okay. So it's going to take a lot more time. And I don't have a golf game or anything or tennis match today. When I set aside my operative day, I plan on being here as long as my patient needs me to do exactly what I can do, the best I can do it. I know it sounds funny for me to say that, but I'm saying it for a reason. Because there actually are a lot of doctors who, believe it or not, their schedule, the way they do surgery, depends on what uh, other fun activities they have planned for the day. So how much time they give you or your surgery depends on when their tea time is. I talk about these things because they're true and it's good to know, good to know the truth. All right, what else can I do here? Let's see if we can get the Grabzilla back in for one or two more bites, standby. See if we can bring home any more of this herniation. We have another question. Sure, that's it. One of our viewers is wondering, why is the disc material white? Why is it white? Yes. Mm. Well, great question. So, um, disc material is typically white because it doesn't have any blood, any blood flow. Blood supply makes things pink. Like, look at your the palm of your hands, right? They're nice and pink. That's because what you're seeing through your skin is the blood in the capillaries and veins. I mean, not, not so much the veins, more the capillaries. But you're seeing blood, and that's blood is red, as you all know. You see some of it right here. But that's why that disc is white, is because the disc doesn't have a blood supply typically. The nucleus pulposus doesn't have a blood supply. 
Now the outer part of the disc, the annulus fibrosus, does have a blood supply, and it itself is not white, it's more of a pinkish red. Basically, when you get scar tissue, which some of what you're seeing is scar tissue, some of it's nucleus, scar tissue doesn't have a color either, it's white. And the reason is scar tissue doesn't have blood. Really old scar tissue that's organized and kind of, we call it mature scar tissue is white. I don't know, I hope that answers the question. Let's see the grabber, not, not the grabzilla, but the regular grabber. One more time. I'm going to try to pull back just a little bit, see what I can do. Maybe I'll get a little more right there with the laser and the grabber. You have Grabzilla. Oh yeah, that was a nice big wad of disc material. Let's see what that did. Yep. That was a good one. Sorry about the poor view, but so did I answer their question there? Stand by. Let's get the grabber in. See a little bit better. It's one of my tricks to see better. You can actually see how much better you can see when you you don't have all that bleeding. see the grabber again sometimes I'll put the grabber in like this just so I can actually see when there gets to be a little too much bleeding so I can see right there is still some herniation and I want to go for that right there I'm gonna get that out laser So, so far we've had some really good questions. Any other ones? Sean? Stand by.
I'm reaching up in there and trying to pull out any more herniation I can get. My grabber around. That's pretty good. Give me that laser. So what's bleeding is we've decompressed the nerve root and those are just epidural veins that are starting to bleed because the root is now well decompressed. I feel pretty good about it. I'm going to wrap this up in the next minute and we'll get the next herniation done. I think we've done everything I can do here. How's our BP? All right. Thanks. All right, stand by. We have these little fumaroles down there. Again, there's not a lot of bleeding, but it's enough to be annoying and make it harder for me to see what I'm doing. But that being said, I feel like we've done everything we can do at this disc. Hopefully it's enough. to the next disc. And that's going to be the next disc above, which is the L45. Okay. So we'll bring our floor row back in, our x-ray machine. Move your shoulder, watch your shoulder. Shot. That's it. We gotta do a little better than that. I'll hold it. Hold pressure here. All right. Um, so what do we need to do to get a better picture? Bring it north, I guess, and uh, drop the fluoro. Bring the table up a little bit. Get a shot. That's pretty good. All right, you can relax, my friend. Yes. Guide wire. So once again, we're gonna repeat the same process shot. We're gonna replace the needle with the guide wire. Then we're gonna remove the needle place the dilator down the guide wire and this is going to create a path to right to the disc that needs to be fixed. Shot. That disc is the 045. Show me the bottom, the sacrum a little bit. I think you're a little higher than I want you to be. Just a tiny bit. Shot. Looks good. There's that pseudo disc. Perfect. I like it. All right, now we can advance the um, dilator. As long as our anesthesiologist gives us the, the green light, thumbs up. Okay, Shot. Shot. Take that. Shot. Okay, we're inside the disc where we want to be. Bring the tube down over the dilator. I like to use a twisting motion so it doesn't catch on anything. Shot. 
Sean? Again, don't try this at home, Sean. This is not to be done in your garage. Sean? Take. Sean? I think we're good. Sean? Perfect. All right, this will be our second and last disc for this patient. We've done three two-level surgeries today. Two levels means two discs. It's technically three levels if it's two discs, but everything is relative to the disc, the disc itself. So it's really two discs, so I call it two levels. It's actually three vertebrae. All right. So once again, we're inside the disc and what we're seeing are pieces of herniation that need to come out. So we're gonna bring them out. Laser. Now this disc is not as blue because we we waited a while, a lot longer than normal, and we um, a lot of the blue dye kind of disappeared. The blue dye doesn't stick around forever; it's just temporary. There's a big piece of herniation right there. Stand by. This will be a nice one to add to the collection. Missed it. Oh yeah, that's a biggie. How are we doing? Good, how's the patient? Stable. Stable, good, good. It's good to hear. Pretty messed up disc right here. A lot of inflammation, all the red stuff. And once again, I, this is the more recent herniation for this patient. So the other one was older, already had it operated on, had a microdiscectomy, it didn't work. Reherniated most likely. But he's got two discs that are bad. I think he talked to a surgeon near his home. They only wanted to do the one disc. If they had only done the one disc, he'd still have problems. This is why, uh, one of the reasons why so many people have back surgery and it doesn't work, because the surgeon didn't do the right surgery. How do we know this patient had two bad discs? Well, number one, I saw it on his original MRI that he brought in, but also I saw that, shoot, Luis, what is that? See it? The line going from, yeah. We're gonna have to check. Mm. All right now. Being a so schmutz, I'm I'm more worried about the. I think it's a lens issue. Is this one of the newer scopes that we repaired or what? There is one that we repaired. Yeah, but yeah. Well, hold it. Let's see. No, I think it's still there. I can see it. You see it? 
Mm -hmm. I don't think it's here. Check it later. Okay. I have a feeling it's going to be the length on the scope. Was this the new company we're using? No, no, no. This one we fixed with uh, Wolf. Uh, yeah, so send this to the new company. You all can see there's a issue with the lens down at, looks like the six, from about seven o'clock arching over to three o'clock and everything below that little bubble. Anyway, it doesn't keep me from doing the surgery, but probably going to have to have the lens take a, take a look at the lens what's the problem it's right here it's right here these are cables the water tracks along the cables So my point is, we repeated the MRI yesterday and we found that the herniation at L45, which the other doctors where he lives weren't even gonna treat, that herniation had gotten much bigger. So this is a perfect example of a patient who would have had surgery on one disc when they really needed two discs fixed. Then they would have problems afterwards, then they would get another MRI and they'd see the L45 disc, then they have to have yet another surgery. So it's important that doctors make the right diagnosis up front for their patients and treat, in my opinion, all the discs that are symptomatic that need to be treated, try to treat them at one time rather than breaking it up into two or three surgeries. I know if I had a back problem and I went to the doctor, I wouldn't wanna have to come back for two or three surgeries to get it fixed. I would want to try to fix it right the first time, which means treating all the levels that are having problems. A lot of doctors, surgeons, spine surgeons, they don't feel comfortable doing more than one, one disc at a time. I would advise you, if you have a surgeon who doesn't want to fix everything that needs to be fixed with one surgery, get a second opinion. Find someone who will. Every time you have spine surgery, you put yourself at risk having a complication from the surgery. So if your risk is 1%, now you've just doubled it to 2%, 100% increase, huh? 100% increase. You don't want to do that to yourself. Medical treatments are really should be designed in such a way to minimize risk to the patient. God. Darn it. Definitely an issue with that lens, huh? You see it. For those of you watching this surgery today on June 9, 2020, you're watching live surgery. If you're watching live surgery, you get to ask questions. Just post your question and I'll answer it for you. I'm getting again a little bit of bleeding from the end plate, which is the, the bone at the bottom of the vertebral body laser standby.
those are all pieces of herniation coming out. Laser. making it a little bit challenging. What's going on with the irrigation? Well, I can't hear you. I know it may be open, but is there enough? I don't see enough irrigation. Right there. It's better now. Laser. Laser. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. He's moving a little bit more than I want him. Mm -hmm. I think five more minutes. Hoping, just very close here.
Sorry it's not a better view for you all, but the patient's had a lot of inflammation. He's got a lot of inflammatory changes that involve blood vessels kind of growing into the end plates and around the herniation as those are just bleeding. That's typical. The more inflamed something is, the more bleeding it's going to have associated with it. So hopefully when I'm done, this thing will start healing and his symptoms will go away. That's what I expect. Because of all the inflammation, it's going to take some time to completely heal. But it will heal. One of the nice features about the laser is that it, it stops some of the bleeding during the surgery. Stand by. Just about done. That's looking a whole lot better. That's sort of the base of the herniation right there. And that's what we've been working on. Say about another minute or two. See, let me get this side right here. Just lay still, we're almost done. You're doing great. Everything's going well. All right. <laughs> Scope off. All right. I feel pretty good about that. <laughs> we never get 100% of the herniations, but the goal is to get enough to eliminate the patient's symptoms. And I think we did that today. It's not 
Remember, it's not a herniation that's the problem. It's the inflammation associated with the herniation or the compression of the nerve root. So as long as I can get the pressure off the nerve root and I can get rid of the inflammation, then I've been successful. The goal is not to get rid of the herniation completely because if that was the goal, there would only be one way to do that, and that would be open back surgery, every case. A little pressure. So just so you can all see, the entire surgery was done through a tiny little cut right here. We fixed two disc herniations. No bone was removed. I think he's going to do real well. Yeah. What? All right. Well, thanks for joining us. I'll come and answer any questions. So if you have any, type them up right now. I'll come answer them for you. I'm going to call EBO5.
All right, everyone, thank you for joining us for the last post-op Q&A of the day. We have Dr. Duke in the room with us ready to answer some of your questions. Go ahead and type your questions up in the chat. I'm going to hand the microphone over to Dr. Duke. He'll talk for a few minutes to give you guys some chances to type in your questions if you have any that are remaining. All righty. Well, that was a tough one. Um, every one of today's cases gave us a challenge for various reasons. The first one was probably the easiest. That patient had had no prior surgeries and just two bulging discs in her back. And we went in and got access to the disc without a problem and we did the surgery. It went really smooth on both. The second patient had a prior fusion at L45 with screws and rods. So we had to work around the fusion and fix the disc above and below the fusion that were causing back pain from herniated disc. Finally, this last patient has had prior surgery with a microdiscectomy done in Colorado at L5-S1. He had a recurrent disc herniation at L5-S1, which was huge. He had a uh, smaller herniation, but significant at L4-5. And both of them were causing back and leg pain on the left side. The patient is a, a large man, you know, he's a big guy, and that poses problems in and of itself, challenges in terms of getting to the, to the disc. And then the disc herniations were really medial, meaning towards the center of the spine, midline, and that creates challenges because you have to start further lateral to get more medial. We did that, and I was able to do a lot. Question is, is it enough? And that we don't know until the patient heals from their surgery. So we'll know for sure in about four weeks. Um, sometimes I'd say 50-50 on whether patients wake up in the recovery area and they know that their symptoms are gone. The other 50%, it takes them a, a few days to recover and then they start feeling their symptoms are gone. So I don't know how our last patient will be, uh, but it was the toughest case and there was a lot of scar tissue as a result of multiple herniations, especially at L5-S1. that kind of just socked in that disc herniation and held it up against the nerve root in the epidural space. I tried to get underneath it and pull it down as much as I could. I used a lot of different tools and techniques. You saw me use the Grabzilla. We used the standard pituitary. We used the laser. I went for a lateral approach, really far lateral entry point and aim more medial. I manipulated the, the tube. I also think I broke the, the scope in the process because I think I either dislodged one of the lenses or I cracked one of the lenses by applying pressure, which stinks because that's a few thousand dollars to fix that. But it is what it is and it comes with the territory. So I feel like we did everything we could to fix him. Hopefully it's enough and time will tell. That being said, it's been a long day, and I appreciate everybody watching and asking questions. I think it's been a very productive day. We did three left-sided, two-level Duke laser disc repairs today in three different circumstances. So I thought it was a really good day. All of our surgeries are broadcast live for the public. They're free. We don't charge money or anybody to watch. And uh, this is all being supported by the Duke Spine Foundation. It's a 501c3 registered with the government, the IRS. If you want to find a, a good foundation to donate to, the Duke Spine Foundation provides free public programming for spine care, such as free spine surgeries, questions and answers, free seminars, a lot of free content um, that we think has a really unique educational twist and that we're offering you to, to participate with our operative team and really be in the operating room with us through the audio-visual inputs, the x-ray inputs, microscopes, fluoroscopes, endoscopes. You get to see what we see, everything we see, just through our eyes. So you get to be part of the surgical team. You get to see the problems as they develop in the operating room. You get to see successful treatment happen in the operating room. You get to see how it's meant to be and what the possibilities are to get rid of your back pain or neck pain in this modern technology era. Uh, you know, there's still unfortunately a lot of hospitals and surgeons that are doing old-fashioned techniques that are doing really more harm than good, and we want the public to be aware of this and make educated decisions for their health care. So it's been my pleasure. Sean, do we have any questions from the audience? 
All right, our audience knows everything, so there's no questions. It's been my pleasure, and I think Sean's pleasure as well. Enjoy your week, and we'll see you all next week when we start over again on Tuesday with a few surgeries already on the books, including fusions. So check back at Duke Spine Institute. Don't forget, we have a Facebook support group that you can ask questions throughout the week, and we'll answer them for you. That's the Spine Surgery Support Group. That is the Facebook support group for Duke Spine Institute, AKA Spine Surgery Support Group. Feel free to, to join, it's free and it's open to the public. And uh, what we don't allow is advertising, but we do allow questions and we provide answers. I hope you've all enjoyed the broadcast. Download the Duke Spine Institute app on your phone or computer. It's also free and it's educational. Until next time.